Priscilla Uppel is an associate professor of English at York University and the author of several books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, including Ontological Necessities, shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize, and The Divine Economy of Salvation. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. The book that we're going to discuss, which has just been published by McGill Queen's University Press. Yes. We are what we mourn, study of the contemporary English Canadian elegy, your reading of Canadian English elegies, challenges tradition and long standing psychological models for successful mourning. So let's get at that. Okay. Uh, in a lot of traditional psychological models and anthropological models of mourning, Successful mourning is when you detach yourself from the loved one who has died. So eventually you, you go through many phases. Anger, your mother. And denial, yeah. and okay. If you're successfully mourning your mother, for instance, it'll be when you no longer really identify with her and are able to essentially cut the strings of your grief. And eventually the daughter becomes a mother, the, a son becomes a father, and in the anthropological model, that's also, you, you detach yourself from the loved one who's died because you're essentially now taking their place and time moves on. You detach yourself from the painful feelings. I don't think you detach yourself from them. Well, I think they're related because f most psychological models that look at unsuccessful mourning or melancholia say that what happens is you become unnecessarily identified with the death of the, the loved one. So you identify with that person or with your own grief too much. And that to be successful griever, you actually need to accept the fact that they're, they're gone and that time, you know, essentially moves on. Mm. If it's a Christian model, let's say, which happens in elegies, in poems that are about the dead, the Christian model would be that you mourn the dead uh, loved one but then eventually you celebrate the fact that they're in heaven and they've moved on to another place and life in the world goes on. Now frequently for poets writing elegies, it's meant that they, for instance, uh, will mourn the death of another young poet. Um, so this is the, the Milton Lycidas kind of a poem or Tennyson in his In Memoriam, he'll mourn the death of a young poet. And then eventually says that the poet is now in heaven, and Milton, or Tennyson, takes that poet's place as the next great poet, which is what happens at the end of both of those poems, is kind of taking on this role of becoming a great poet yourself. Or, or taking the baton from them. And But Shakespeare, one of his most beautiful lines has to do with us becoming our parents. Yes, the anthropological we model... We extend their lives. Yeah, you extend their lives because you are essentially, in a pattern, replacing them in their roles in society. What I'm looking at is the fact that now, especially with Canadian elegies, what I found by reading you know, thousands of them <laughs> was that this being a country of immigrants, you know, almost everyone's an immigrant, but Aboriginal peoples notwithstanding, that the attachment to whatever you're mourning is actually a way to claim that as an identity. So people are mourning parents more often than they're mourning young people. They're mourning their parents in these poems because they actually feel like they didn't know their parents. If they're going to take on their parents' role, they don't even know what that was exactly. Or if they're mourning ancestors in their past or a certain community, uh, the whole act of mourning actually becomes a way to attach yourself. So instead of this detachment model of mourning, Canadians use mourning as a creative act to, in fact, create the past and create history as a means to, to carry on into the future. That's basically what I was, I was looking at. And why this might be happening and a necessary creative act in the late 20th and early 21st century which is now becoming a completely you know, global community in many ways, so that people are not only continually changing or forming new identities as we move around and you know, become influenced by other cultures, but also because what you actually mourn will determine 
how you perceive your past. What is it you're upset that you've lost? And so a lot of the poets, because I mean, you're looking at the body of work that's there to, mm-hmm. to, to, to come up with these conclusions. So these poets have chosen to mourn the death of parents over, let's say, place or, or children or... Is there a greater percentage of mourning about parents than there would normally be? Yes. <laughs> okay. There is. In many conventional elegies, particularly in the English elegy tradition, would be people mourning youth. Uh, people mourning the death of of children or the death Mm. of young people because Mm. there's a perception of the loss of potential, right? right? That this is something that's even more tragic tragic to us, the the death of a young person. And so that has traditionally been uh, a whole elegy category. (laughs) Not so much death of parents until the 20th century. Uh, I think what's also happening there is, is one of the differences that I see between for instance, Canadian elegies and American elegies, and there have been books on the American elegy which argue this, is that in the mythical mourning model, which is Orpheus and Eurydice, the husband and wife, the young people who uh, get married, and Eurydice, the wife, dies on the wedding day. Orpheus is filled with grief. He asks to go down into the underworld to retrieve her. Um, They say okay because they're so moved by his song. They say that's all right, but... You know, you can't look back until you've brought her back from the underworld. And, of course, at the last second, he looks back and loses her forever. And he's grieving this all the time. So for poets, Orpheus has been a persona for the grieving poet. And, again, that, that poet in some way having to accept but refusing to accept that Eurydice has died. The American elegy tends to place a lot of the emphasis in late 20th century elegies on the person who's suffering, on the person who's dying. So there are lots of elegies, there there are lots of breast cancer elegies and AIDS elegies, and really concentrating on the fact that, no, this person is dying. I don't care so much about the poet anymore, Mm. the person who's grieving. Let's look at the person who's dying. So they're not dead yet. They're they're in the process of dying. Yeah, or it'll be that they've died, and they're going to look back on the suffering that that individual... Uh, went through bef- before they died. What does that tell us about Americans then? Well, I think Americans have always been interested in um, the individual, in the person on the margins, in the person who is in somehow protesting. Or the struggle too, I, I guess. Yeah. The and struggle for what? Freedom or health or escaping death or. I, I think so, in, in terms of also the ethos around, you know, the expanding frontier or something mm. as well. So that that makes sense, I think, for the American elegy. So there is a book, for instance, that says that the emphasis is all on Eurydice. So the emphasis is all on the dead loved mm. one. Mm-hmm. In the Canadian elegy, what I noticed is that the mourners really want to talk to the dead. Like they're, So they're almost staging conversations and, in fact, are staging conversations in some of the poems, but Uh, A lot of the poems tend to be long poem elegies Mm -hmm. as opposed to a short lyric or even to, you know, a couple of lyrics. They either tend to be these long poetic sequences, uh, mourning, or a long poem, so a very extended uh, single poem. And I think that what ends up happening there, it's because the poets are trying to talk to the dead And they have to do this through many different strategies, so whatever poetic strategies they have. So what you get in in the Canadian elegy is this invitation for Eurydice to actually come back from the dead Mm -hmm. so you can have a conversation with her. And I I noticed, too, I mean, a lot of Canadian fiction is is a bit obsessed with ghosts, Mm. uh, but certainly the poetry is obsessed with with ghosts. One of the things that comes to mind, then, is a couple of things, but first of all, just the fact that the children, the first generation immigrants, may not really have known what life was like in the old country, and then their parents sort of spent their whole lives trying to make life better for their kids mm-hmm. without really conveying the tradition. Would you say that's Yes, accurate? and I think that that's what's, what is evident in a number of the elegies. I constructed the book into three main chapters. One is Elegies for Parents. Another one is Elegies for Places, and the third one is uh, Elegies for Displaced Communities. 
So we've talked a little bit about the parents, but there's also in terms of places coming to live in a place and not really knowing its history, not really knowing how that place became the place that you're in, or having the elegy mourning the fact that the place is now a ghost town and hasn't been, you know, properly memorialized or appreciated by the people who now you know, walk by it or whatever. So, for example, then old buildings would have been demolished and skyscrapers put up, or... Yes, yes. So you might have with Al Purdy, for instance, he'll write about mills, mills that have been abandoned, Roblin's mills, or he'll write about the country north of Belleville. The good old days. Yes. (laughs) Wanting to bring them back. I mean, even with the Al Purdy elegies, I don't think the intent is to bring it back, but I think the intent is to recognize that whenever you're looking at a place, it's several places at once. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the same thing with, with mourning the parents. Uh, the reason I call We Are What We Mourn is because it's an acknowledgement that you are all of these other people too. Um, and so with the places, you are all these other places. And then with the communities, I have things like, I discuss Ann Michaels' Holocaust elegies or Dion Brand's elegy, uh, No Language is Neutral for... A, sort of a slave history in her family and those elegies end up connecting them to this whole history and ancestry that they can also bring to Toronto or that they can Mm. bring to Calgary or wherever else and and that becomes a larger landscape which is real but also very imagined so that Mm. they can constantly change it which I think is is a good thing so this is the part about challenging mourning most of the traditional models of mourning have some sense of time, right? That mm-hmm. if you're still grieving you after know, two a certain years amount of time, then, you, then you've got depression, not grieving. Exactly. Then you've got depression, then you've got melancholia, then you've got a whole host, maybe a neuroses, a host of other problems. And of course, a lot of uh, cultures and religions institute timelines. Like after a year, you stop wearing black, after, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or you have a, a, another small ritual. And what I'm arguing in this book Mm. is that I'm arguing that mourning never ends. No, it's almost like you've said. I mean, you go to a place, that place has has all sorts of previous inhabitants and it's got a history, so it's like these elegies are preserving history. Yes, I see them as preserving history. Archival almost. But also making it possible to write the future. It's not nostalgia, and it's not just to, you know, memorialize or remember certain historical figures or uh, that these places existed, but these become important because they're still there. And people are trying to figure out how to use what's still there. Like these mills, for example. Yeah, even if they don't exist, but the mills actually, so I think they do exist, <laughs> That's a physical one. It's still there. So why are you ignoring it? It's Mm. still a part of yourself and your identity. How do you take that in in a creative way um, in terms of your sense of regionalism or or localism or even nationalism? But in the places, let's say, where there are not those physical memorials still there or physical reminders, that time isn't linear, Right, that that time still exists and still has an effect. The things that occurred it's kind of are multi- in some ways still occurring. Manifold. It's 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 yeah a, a cross cut of everything that's taken place there. What manifesting itself somehow in it's, in what? It, yeah, it still exists. And that I think frequently we don't recognize how whatever space we're in, you can trace how that space was created if you just knew everything that happened in its past Mm -hmm. (laughs) right in the way exactly you're saying like a cross section if you if you dig and you cut down Mm -hmm. into the earth Mm -hmm. you will be told certain stories of things that happened there in these elegies canadians are trying not to ignore those stories they may not know what they are right that's the problem you may not Mm -hmm. have the exact facts i mean a lot of times even when you're trying to you're guessing, but guessing can be creative rather than destructive. So mm. again, the mourning, just because it doesn't end, doesn't have to be a negative thing. It doesn't have to be debilitating. It can actually be something that means that you're constantly being creative. You're constantly being fluid. You're constantly reinventing yourself and moving as mm. opposed to being static. Sort of flushing out <coughs> of your system. Excuse me. 
instead of flushing it away and cl- sort of cleansing yourself, it's more what an acknowledgement that you are rooted. Yeah, you're not cleansing yourself. So you're not saying it's over. The morning is over. I'm through with that. You're saying actually it's inside of me all the time. Mm. I'm just constantly making room for other <laughs> other things too. And so uh, the reason that this is being done is to get a better grip on who they are, their identities, so that they can then understand what themselves better or I think it's yeah, it's a sense of of identity but also of the establishing of community. I mean, mm. I don't think I don't think a community necessarily has to be people who are all alive in the same place and in the same time that you are. When I think of being a professor mm. and what my community is, my imaginative community, it includes uh, Cervantes, and it includes Dunn, and it includes other people, right? And it includes people that I read who who live halfway around the world that I've never met who may be alive. So I think that with the elegies with mourning, it's not even just to understand the self better, but to expand one's sense of community and one's sense of connectedness to other places to other parts of culture that maybe have come to you through your ancestry but also through just living in a certain place and being exposed to people and then as well to um other anything other languages other Mm -hmm. groups of mourners too so you can see for instance in those Anne michael elegies about the holocaust she can't name the people that she's grieving but through the act of grieving, she accepts them as part of her own fate or her own humanity. And I think that any time we can create larger networks of connectedness, then we're more able to move in an empathetic way in the world. So I think that's why it's more important. It's not necessarily a selfish desire to just know myself, like find mm-hmm. out who I am. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually a sense to find out who we are. Yeah, there's a sort of a cross-cultural interest. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it can be regional, it can be national, mm-hmm. it can be global, but it could also be just, uh, as I said, different cultural communities. A lot of people are mourning parts of their ancestry that they really didn't know very well mm-hmm. from, from what you were saying before. Actually, that's a little bit what goes on in my novel, too, the new novel, uh, To Whom It May Concern. The, the father... Uh, is South Asian, the oldest daughter is about to get married, and he bought her this red sari, which is very traditional for South Asians to get married in, you know, before she was born, he basically bought this beautiful sari. And when the mother reminds her of this, she's a sari? Like, I've never worn a sari, I don't, I don't speak Hindi, I don't have any of these things. But by the end of the book, she actually wants that sorry and she doesn't even know why she really Mm. wants the sorry except that if she doesn't get it there's some kind of thing that her father imagined for her that is now lost if she Mm. if she doesn't accept his gift but by then the gift is gone he's 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 already uh because in in that i try not to give too much away but in that story he's uh losing his house um he's in the process of having his house taken away from him so one of the things that he and his home care worker decide to do is to try and sell a bunch of the things in the house. And because his daughter has already rejected the sari, he puts it up on eBay. Oh. <laughs> That's funny, you know. It reminds me of that famous O. Henry story. Oh, my a- gosh. About the uh, the hair Yes, brush I know what you're talking Yes, the, the hair brush. Yes, yes, yes. I just haven't thought of that in so long. Yeah. yeah that's right. I'm speaking with Priscilla Apple, who is an associate professor of English at York University and has just, in addition to having written a, a novel, published a work of nonfiction called We Are What We Mourn, the Contemporary English-Canadian Elegy. We talked earlier about the predominance of ghosts in Canadian literature, and I first started to do a bit of research for this interview. Uh, I couldn't help but think of William Lyon Mackenzie King mm-hmm. and his attempts to connect with his mother. Yeah. He also, I think a young, there was a young man, a young friend of his who died. and There's a, a statue to him, oh. like sort of an elegy, I think, 
in front of Parliament, the Parliament buildings. It seems that mourning uh, and uh, connecting with the dead played a, a pretty big role in his life. Did you, did you come across any reference to him at all? or He's sometimes mentioned in the elegies, in American elegies and in British elegies. Frequently there are these great elegies for important historical figures. They're, yeah. You know, they're great elegies for Queen Elizabeth, they're great elegies for George Washington, what have you. Yeah. And we don't really have them. Like, we don't have a great elegy for uh, Mackenzie King. We don't have a great elegy for Trudeau. We don't. <laughs> and why is this? So, so they're they're exploring that question. But I I do think that um, with the idea of of you know wanting to talk to ghosts and, and mourning, there's a, a line in a Earl Burney poem that's quoted in the introduction. That's it's by our own lack of ghosts we're haunted. It's like our uh, the fact that we're so hung up on trying to establish what identity we have because we don't seem to have one yeah and who am i going to ask to to help guide me who who you know so that's Mackenzie king's problem mm-hmm. you know, who am i going to ask to help me make decisions i think he also used to ask his dog his dog yeah. <laughs> yeah, Pat, I think it was. Yeah. the dog and then trying to get in contact <laughs> with the dead mother well like yeah ouija boards and uh but Yates was into this sort of thing too. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. He was into the occult and talking to the dead. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not it's not specific to Canada. I think that interest, but certainly when you look at what a culture is writing as a whole, you see that this is a little bit of an obsession here. And I think we can understand it in 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 this sense. There are lots of Canadian studies programs in Germany, in Italy. I meet a lot of the professors who come to York University and say, you know, we're just fascinated by Canadian literature. And, you know, of course, that makes me very pleased, but I'll say, well, why are you fascinated? And and they basically come up with variations of, of this response, which is, when you're in Germany, you're always reminded everywhere you go what it means to be German. When you're in Italy, you're reminded everywhere when it means to be Italian and who your great artists are and your great architects and your great politicians and all of this. And, mm-hmm. and it's almost suffocating to people mm-hmm. that they're told this is who you are. They said the Canadians, all of your novels about how you have no idea who you are. We find, <laughs> we find this like really not only just fascinating, but they find it liberating. Yeah. They think it's just a wonderful, freeing thing to not know who you are. Which is so ironic because, I mean, we get so much of that. We get fed up with it and bored of it yeah. just in the same way that they get fed up with their Germanness. Yeah, when people say we don't know what it means to be Canadian, is it just hockey or something? People get yeah, or angry. Un-Ameri- we're just not American. Not American, yeah. yeah. So I think that, the, and there is that tension in a lot of the poems about whether or not the lack of identity is something to be upset about, something to find troubling, something to to grieve in mm. in a in a in a very uh, upset way. Or is this actually an opportunity? Is mm. this actually something that's positive? Well, and something I'm actually to celebrate. on that side, that it's something yeah. that in the end is positive because it means that you are acknowledging the imaginative space that being a person is about as well. So you, you can change it. The story shouldn't be so fixed and locked in. Well, and also being beyond things like nation, stepping out of that the horror that nationalism brings with it. Yeah. Yeah, which can uh, also be a dangerous yeah, <laughs> force. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the best things about being Canadian is you don't have to be overtly patriotic. I mean, if you didn't sing the national anthem in the United States, you'd be looked upon as being a traitor, just how, you know, what George Bush did with mm. his bringing in legislation that allowed for wiretapping. Yes. Yeah. You know, if you if you do anything that's against the battle against terrorism, then you're unpatriotic. Whereas here, it's much much less of a, a pressure. It's yeah. It's not a public pressure, but I think that what that's done is it actually makes people more genuinely patriotic <laughs> in some ways. Because I went grateful to- <laughs> for the freedom that we have. You mean? Grateful for the freedom as being part of what it means to be Canadian. Mm -hmm. And that therefore, yeah, that people associate it with part of the advantages of being Canadian. Mm -hmm. Is that you do get to invent yourself. You don't Mm -hmm. have the public pressure to be constantly waving a flag. But at the same time, I, I went across the country for six weeks 
just last year, um, I started my sabbatical and, and I actually saw my sabbatical trip, this trip across Canada, as being the end of my PhD, even though I'd already received my PhD, I'd already written this book, but because I had never really done that trip, mm. and I did it by train, mm. uh, almost all by train, and I did it from the west to the east, so I started in Victoria and I ended in Charlottetown. Um, I missed part of the north, but that's a whole other trip <laughs> as far as I'm mm. concerned. But one of the things that I found uh, very moving was that wherever I went, you know, people are constantly asking what does it mean to be Canadian and there are a lot of separatist se sentiments in certain provinces and all that. But overall, people are just, they all are happy to be Canadian. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll gripe about the government, they'll gripe about all these other things that are going on in their communities and what have you. And they'll say, you know, the Torontonians are different than us out west or whatever. But they'll say, well, I'm Canadian. It is an imaginative space, so I think people are looking for something concrete when they're trying to figure out what connects Canadians together. And I've heard certain people lecture and the audience get really angry when someone tries to say, well, really, it's just a, a political body that connects the whole country. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is the people who are angriest are the most recent immigrants. They're like, what do you mean? That's not why I came here. They're very much invested in the idea. No, it's the imagination about what Canada is. It's, it's that yeah. imaginative space that makes us all part of a shared future, even though we're all so different. And when people try to reduce it, I think, to something that's concrete, they'll mm. say, but that's not a fact. You can't look at that and say that's a fact. But you know, I say, how yeah. much of our day is spent imagining things? <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, so much of being an immigrant is about hope. We have to, I think, look at our imaginative lives as being stuff that's factual. It well, determines everything we do, right, practically, so... Yeah, power of positive thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking with Priscilla Uppel, who's a professor at York University, about uh, contemporary English-Canadian elegy. So traditionally, this is just a couple of notes taken from Contemporary Guide to Literary Terms. It refers to poetic meter. It mm -hmm. also is a reflection on the death of someone or on sorrow generally. A reflection uh, also of something strange or mysterious to the author. Did you get much of that in what you read? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The ghost stuff? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that part of the reason that people are fascinated enough to write these poems and, and a lot of long poems about the past or about a place is because of that mysterious aspect. They, they don't know what it is. Mm. It's still not part of their identity, so it's still foreign. It's still unknown. It's still a land that is in many ways uncharted or untapped. So, yeah, th there is that certainly the confrontation with s something outside of their general, I guess you would call it like comfort zone. In some cases, it can be an encounter with the supernatural, and mm -hmm. that's what, you know, part of the elegy is if you're trying to speak to the dead. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily use the word supernatural, but because that has kind of, I think, science fiction or horror mm -hmm. connotations, but that is what's going on, is, is the confrontation of, of something outside of what we normally consider to be our concrete chronological lives. And so the, I think there's also the, in, in the space of the poem and in mourning, there is also a reorientation around time. And that can be seen as a confrontation of the foreign and the strange to be reordering time so that people don't live in the past, they don't die in the past, they're still in the present for you to learn from them. What about this one? Especially for like, I'm a first generation immigrant. Okay. I was born here, but I lived in England for a good part of my childhood, seven or eight years, and I don't feel connected to Canada. Okay. I don't feel connected, rooted to the land. I feel sort of halfway between here and England. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if that plays a role in these elegies. I mean, we've we sort of touched on yeah. that. It's yeah, like absolutely. Seeking roots because. They don't have any here in Canada. Yeah, and then and then mourning becomes a way to establish your sense of who you are now within that place. There are certainly a number of poets have been born here. Mm. A number of poets are immigrants, first generation immigrants. And so their concerns are slightly different. Some of them feel that maybe they know who it is to be Canadian, but they don't they don't know anything about 
their parents' lives in Europe, let's say. And then others have immigrated here, like a Dion Brand has immigrated here, and never feels at home. Like she says, I don't really feel at home until she learns to say uh, Spadina instead of Spadina, when Spadina is actually historically correct. <laughs> she's pronouncing it properly, but that means that she's actually not a Canadian yet. She's not a Torontonian. So that for, for a number of the uh, writers, there is a sense of being torn between places and not having a home anywhere. And so the space of mourning actually becomes an acknowledgement of this and, and allows them to imaginatively move around between those identities. And I think when it's positive, what people end up finding is that they don't have to choose. You know, it, it may mean that you always have a part of yourself that you're grieving, but you don't have to choose. You, it, it can be, again, an opportunity that you belong to many places rather than just one. Right, sort of, again, multidimensional complexity. These poems are, are trying to deal with the complexity of what it means to be a human being in the late 20th and yeah. 21st century. Well, and being mobile, uprooting. The Nobel Prize winning poet Derek Wolcott wrote an elegy for Che Guevara mm -hmm. that played an important role in the Cuban Revolution of the late 50s. And he uses things such as the deliberate exaggeration of equating Shay's death with the death of liberty and the idea of mourning for the dead one as being both public and private. I mean, you talked about the fact that in England and the States there seem to be more elegies for well-known mm -hmm. heroes. Why isn't that? We just don't have enough of them or we don't respect them enough? or I think it's, again, a combination of <laughs> factors. And the poets are trying to figure that out, too. And most of them don't really make the argument that we don't have enough of them. But usually that they're either not respected, they're not appreciated, or you're not taught them. We're not really taught to have these great figures that we're supposed to revere overall. I think we get taught about certain battles and about certain treaties and about cer <laughs> certain documents that are signed, right. but not necessarily that it's all one player who, who made this all happen. But Johnny MacDonald is, I mean, a pretty pretty significant character in our, in our history. He is, but... But he was a booze hound, so maybe, <laughs> maybe it's difficult to write an elegy for him. Nothing he came across? Oh, yeah, no, th there are. I mean, one of the people who does this the most is, is uh, Milton Acorn on Prince Edward Island. He's constantly writing these elegies and these poems about historical figures that he thinks everyone has forgotten and should see as revolutionaries and, you know, potential revolutionaries. So he says, you know, we still haven't won the revolution because he wants to be free of British rule. We never really fought a revolution. Maybe that yeah, has something to do that's with it. Not People say that has to do with it um, in terms of having a you know, major political crisis that ends up bringing heroes to the forefront mm. and all. And I think that's true. What I end up seeing between, you know, American and British and Canadian there too is is the British have such, you know, I'm obviously overgeneralizing, mm. but the British have such a sense of hierarchy, at, right? And, and class. a class system mm. and a hierarchy. And they are just naturally suited within that mindset to be writing elegies about figures that they believe are, are worthy to be praised that are on top of them, so to speak. Mm. And then the Americans, mm. because they're so wrapped up in the idea of the individual being able to combat all of that nonsense. The, com the common man, I <laughs> the, suppose. Sir. The, the common yeah. man who, who uh, you know, rags to riches. It's by your own will and your own hard work. You can be a hero. Everyone can be a hero. So they tend to write a lot about the individual who, who's also the rebel, the margin. But in Canada, I think we actually have a much more socialist sense of our history. Mm -hmm. And it's about communities that did things. It's about, it's about whole groups of people. Even in, in terms of language, it, it's very common in a lot of other European poetry to say we, to speak in, in that plural. It's very uncommon in American verse it's more common in Canadian verse. In American, it's I? Well, yeah. Th what I usually or point e. to is the quintessential American poem is to me the song of myself. It's, you know, it's <laughs> Walt Whitman. I know he's meaning to encompass the whole United States, mm -hmm. but it is the song of myself. I am this. I am the United States of America. I am all this. And, and it's that, that constant... Me, me, me. Yes, 
that constant <laughs> reiteration of the individual and yeah. the presence of the individual. And in, in Canadian writing, there's there's a lot of actually not wanting to speak for everybody. Uh, not sorry, not wanting to speak for the self, yeah. but also not wanting to speak for everybody. But trying to find that balance of. I can say certain things about my experience, and this is also why when grieving, you want the dead person to come back and talk so that they can tell their story too. Mm. So, so talking about a mosaic then? Yeah, in the poetry, that it, it can reflect a mosaic. One of the things I find really interesting about death rituals and mourning rituals is that a lot of them are designed around the idea that you have to bury the dead properly with mm. you know certain respect, with certain um, conditions and, and uh, ornaments and ritual, and, and most of that is designed so that they don't come back. So they can survive the journey, or they can survive the journey, and then they can exist in that other realm, whatever realm you believe it to be. They're not mm. going to come back. If, if, if there's a ghost, we usually consider the ghost is angry. They have unresolved issues. Mm. <laughs> you know, they want to haunt the community. They want revenge, whatever that is. So a lot of these rituals are designed to, to make sure that, that that the dead person has a safe trip. But mm. it's also about showing proper respect and, and hopefully you know they won't come back they're not supposed to come back yeah yeah so the the canadian elegists are in fact going against all that because they're saying please come back we 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 didn't learn don't leave us teach us teach us we didn't learn what we were supposed to learn yet and we actually want you still here in some way because we miss you yeah we miss you we didn't even know we missed you and i think that comes back to the historical figures too when you end up reading about canadian historical figures i think they're just as fascinating but we don't as yet, I think. I mean, we do have some mini series now and again, but what about I Wayne Gretzky? Did you come uh, across one for Wayne Gretzky or Paul Henderson? Or there's actually a book that was just published on called the Sawchuck Poems. I can't oh, remember yes. the name of the author right now. I you did come up with a couple things like that, but they they didn't occur enough for me to study them as a trend. That's mm. what I was trying to look at and see yeah. what what are the predominant things that people are doing. Mm. There are some for historical figures. There are some elegies for historical figures, but they tend not to be the dominant subgenres of the elegy. So it, it did show a kind of lack on poets part to go after that kind of subject matter so i wanted to look at why yeah. and usually it's the case of canadian history as being something that has been undervalued um not taught and, and infrequently not respected so that's almost you know it's, is it laughable to think of these pi politicians as revolutionaries yeah. i mean is that che Guevara quality revolutionary since you mm. brought him up in, in asking these questions, though, I think the poets draw your attention to you want to go back and think of, yeah, who are the Canadian heroes? Who are the historical figures that we should be remembering? There are books, but, you know, when I think of my students, you may find this surprising. Many of them don't know who the Prime Minister is when you actually ask them who the, the Prime Minister is. The current one. The current one, they yeah. don't know. They're just not bombarded with images of Canadian political and historical figures all the time in the way that you are perhaps in the United States or England. I mean, there are no big blockbuster movies yet, so it's going to get. There, there are miniseries sometimes about Trudeau, or there, you know, there'll be miniseries mm. about certain, the, the War of 1812 or mm. Passchendaele, but not that same mega blockbuster like Pearl Harbor or... Mm. Or the Queen, or what? Mm. We just don't have that kind of money. <laughs> we don't have that kind of money. We don't have that kind of money. Maybe it comes down to some money too. Mm. But uh, mm-hmm. so I think it's just it's just not being reinforced. Even when people do learn their Canadian history, it takes a little while to think. Oh yeah, what did I learn about that person again? So you think that poets are trying to fill that void, even though not many people read poetry, let alone Canadian poetry. They are trying to fill that void. I think they're also trying to make a case. for for the fact that even when people are unknown, even when they're not famous, of course, is also the big... The song of myself is as much to make Walt Whitman famous as anybody (laughs) else, right? Even if there's not that fame in the people that they are mourning, they were still really important and still are really important. So I think that's more what the poets are exploring in in, in their poems, that, that they are trying to make a case of... The past is important, past cultures are important, because the present and the future are important. Sounds like Santayana's quote about we're doomed to repeat, oh, to repeat it if we past. don't remember. Just in closing then, there's a couple of a couple of things I'd like to look at. One is the psychological aspect of what you've 
uncovered. You're challenging the definition of successful mourning. Yes. Based on what? You're saying that the elegies, the fact that these have been written and, and read, has proven useful to different communities within Canada, let's say, because they're not trying to separate themselves from past Mm -hmm. and dead. The problem is with mourning, it's so, you go through it and whatever happens to you happens to you individually. And they say about the the different steps that Mm -hmm. we, we referred to. What are you saying is a successful way of mourning then? From what I've seen, a successful way of mourning, in terms of the circumstances that people are finding themselves in, you know, nation of immigrants coming from all kinds of different backgrounds with a history that people don't even recognize or respect in Canada, that successful mourning is a constant reinvitation to take in the past, to acknowledge what you want to grieve to you keep yes. mourning and yeah. that's that's the major difference and I, and I, and I don't want to actually leave the impression that the poets themselves are the bright lights who have thought this up i think that mm. what they're doing is actually reflecting something that's already going on that we're just not acknowledging so even if the psychologists say you know you have to finish mourning at a certain time or it's unhealthy we all know that's not what we're doing so <laughs> So the poets are the first to, I think, tell the truth about it maybe sometimes, Mm. but it's not their individual truth. I think that's the truth of a culture that's saying, but I still mourn the fact that I don't know anything about my grandparents, or I'm still Mm. mourning the fact that I live in in Calgary and and it keeps, it gets bigger and then it gets the ghost town, then it gets bigger again. There's an elegy by Aretha Van Herc in that I discuss in the book called Calgary, This Growing Graveyard. She seems to mourn the fact that it's been this very transient place. People go there, they work there, they want to make money there. But she asks, how many people get buried here? There's there's actually a lack of graveyards in Calgary. Uh, yeah. But lots of so, them in Victoria, though. But lots of yeah, because of the people go there yeah. to retire. But but that sense of, of where you want to be buried actually does say something about where you feel most connected, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're not being buried in Calgary, but you've lived there for 20 years, why didn't you make that connection to that place? I'm not the one who's necessarily challenging all these traditional ideas of mourning, they have changed, and I'm just pointing them out through the elegies that I've discovered. Okay, so how should we, you know, let's say a listener has had the, uh, their mother has died. Okay. So how can they get over that? No, no. They're not going to get over that. <laughs> but that's the first acknowledgement. So. <laughs> and then, so how can they most healthily, based on what you've come up with and discovered, deal with that? I think to acknowledge the past, remember the past, and not be afraid to bring it into the present in the ways that are most useful to you or to your family. And, you know, not having to stop telling those stories. You can keep telling those stories. You don't have to leave the dead dead. The, the dead are around us all the time. I truly mm. believe this. You mean like um, ghosts or like <laughs> in your own imagination? No, I think that, that, that you know, if I, if, if I could see into my own DNA, this is millennia old, right? That, that yes. they're, they're in us all the time. Yes. They're around yeah. us all the time. Every tree I look at, you know, has a history. Every, every step I take on the earth has a history. Uh, I think it's more about acknowledging that history. And even when it's unknown, taking a part of it and allowing it to affect you and, and to make a connection. You're mourning your mother, yes, but I think that it also makes you, if you approach it a certain way, more capable of empathizing with other mothers or making connections to other people who've also lost a parent or lost a child or what have you. It's, it's just the way that you take the past into yourself, I think, is the issue. And that you're going to do this in different ways. You feel good time. about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't think mourning is is supposed to be a happy process. No. But I think that it can be a very valuable and beneficial process. And I think that a lot of 20th century psychology has resulted in people thinking that any kind of traditionally negative feeling 
should be banished, should be shunned. You know, you don't feel shame, mm. don't feel guilt, don't feel sad. Mm. You know, if you're if you're depressed, don't show but, anything. Don't show anything. Whereas I think that all of those emotions, even when they're difficult and complex to work through, are human emotions that you have to experience to be human. If you're not upset that someone's died, that's more of a problem to me than if you are. And, and then if you are, of course, then you're just finding ways to be able to carry that grief, but not let it destroy you. You want to use it in, in some way that I think honors the dead. Honors the dead and also perhaps uh, allows you to become more fully who you are. Yeah. If that doesn't sound too flaky. No, it allows you to acknowledge parts of yourself and transform yourself through mm. through the people that you, you're mourning or the places that you're mourning. Or. Do you have, in all the reading that you did, do you have one... <laughs> oh, that's my favorite? Yeah, or something that you uh, that may, may had the greatest impact on you? Oh, actually, I would say it's it's really as a whole. Um, oh, okay. it's very, it is very hard for me to separate. I I still go back a lot to the Anne Michaels elegies. Do you have one? Do you have one in the book? Yeah, what the light teaches. Could you read? Is there oh, that's a long one, but I could read a section from. Yeah, it. Yeah, let's it, do that, okay. and that's that's the way we'll go out. <laughs> All right. Who has a book coming out? So. Uh, yeah, after many years, right? Okay, let me her uh, her fugitive pieces was just made into a movie, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it came out last last year. Last year, yeah. I didn't yeah. see it. I have to be honest. Yeah, me I haven't neither. seen it yet, but yeah. great. I'll read this part because it actually reflects what we were talking about about the earth having time and mourning in it. So this is from Anne Michaels' elegy, "What the Light Teaches." Suspended in flux, in contortions of disorder. In the frozen acrobatics of folding and faults, the earth mourns itself. Continents torn in half and turned into coastlines call for themselves across the sea. Caves, frantic for air, pull themselves up by the ground, fields collapsing into empty sockets. Everywhere, the past juts into the present. Mountains burst from one era to another, or crumple up millennia, time joining at its ends. Very good. It puts me in mind of the group of seven and the, the land. There are elegies for Tom Thompson. Oh, is in that disgust right? in there, yeah. Oh, okay. I should have mentioned the Canadian painters come off fairly well. <laughs> oh, do they? Okay. Thank you for coming uh, off so well in our conversation. Oh, thank you. I've enjoyed it. I've been speaking with Priscilla Uppel, who is an associate professor of English at York University in Toronto and the author of a number of books of poetry and fiction, including Ontological Necessities, shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize, The uh, Divine Economy of Salvation, and you've just come out with a novel... To Whom It May Concern. And that's published by... Uh, By Doubleday Canada, and it's a loose rewrite of King Lear, modern retelling of King Lear set in Ottawa. Fantastic. Thanks very much again. Thank you.